Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tricia Carey. I'm with Tencel. And today we're doing a little take on the temperature and what is happening in the denim industry. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mosin, for that introduction and for setting everything up. I'm really excited to be here today with this esteemed panel of women who between them have handled various roles in creative and business facets within the denim industry. Based in the UK and Belgium, their experience spans global denim brands, including Amazon, ASOS, Burberry, CNA, Gas, Gucci, M&S, Next, Outland, EVH, Stella McCartney, VF, White Weft, and more. The effect of the COVID pandemic has been significant, with over a quarter of a million deaths and rising. The lockdown policies of most governments has seen the biggest fall in consumer confidence since, since records began. And this is compounded by the latest unemployment figures from the US Labor Department, predicted by economists to be as high as 20%, a level unseen since the 1930s Great Depression. It has been widely recognized that from Germany to New Zealand and Denmark to Thailand, Women leaders are doing a disproportion, disproportionately great job at handling the pandemic, having employed particularly effective strategies. With that in mind, what insights can today's panelists bring to the questions hanging over the past, present, and future of our lives and our industry? We now have the opportunity to rebuild what was an $80 billion denim industry we finally have a chance to right the wrongs of the past. So what do we plan to do about this? The apparel industry is made of people. We are the people to bring the changes we wish to see. The $2.4 trillion apparel industry employs 75 million global workers, from design to factory to retail, 80% of which are women. So today we wanted to get the input of these esteemed women and joining me today is Claire Ford from Outland Denim, Harmony Genovese from, uh, who's a designer of denim, Janelle Hanna from White Weft, Kelly Harrington from Trademark Blue, Laura Dixon from 3x1 mm -hmm. Europe, Leanne Jay who's a denim specialist, Melon Ekrin, who's also a denim specialist. Sadia Rafiq from End Rhyme. Sally Denton, from, who's also a denim consultant. And Sue Barrett, who's from Denim Forum. So the format for our discussion today is that I will ask several questions for the group. And for about 20 to 30 minutes, we'll have uh, our discussion. And then we'll open to some questions from the audience. So. This is quite a large panel, but these women, we have a, a lot to say and uh, a lot of great ideas. And I think now is the time when we need to be able to get together and exchange this information. Um, we already have some questions that have been submitted to us. So we want to allow time for the questions. Um, and so I'll get, I'll get started then for our panelists. And we'll start with the first question and uh, we'll kick this off with Sally, if you can tell us what is really the brand's responsibilities now and how should they be working with their factory suppliers? Sally? Hi. Hi, Tricia. Hi, don't, Tricia. don't get me started. We could be here a long time. I know. <laughs> the brands and yeah. retailers really need to look at themselves and they need to look at their ethical strategies at the moment and their current behavior. It's not, it seems like it's a real time everybody's going every man for himself and that's not the future of the business. Um, I've been hearing of some really shocking discounts up to 90% and also extended payment terms up to 300 days. It's absolutely beyond belief. Um, are they really, are the suppliers really going to go back to their factories and say, workers, we can't pay you for 300 days? Um, I'm really, really disappointed in a lot of people in the industry, to be really frank. Um, uh, we've been starting a little bit of a campaign going for, um, I used to work for Debenhams a few years ago. And um, they called the administrators in who immediately laid off the Bangladesh team. And not only have they kind of not paid them any redundancy, they got no notice. 
they actually haven't paid them for the last month they work. And these are people who are really, really dedicated to the brand. They were so proud to work for Debenhams, um, as are many other suppliers in the same situation. Um, and it's got to change. I think it's the administrators I hear that are causing a lot of the problem with the payments more than the brand. But still, the managing director of this company is sharing his uh, stories in Draper's record and is hailed as a local champion. And that is just incredible. So the suppliers work so hard for us. We all push them so hard. We ask for a ridiculous amount of samples sometimes and suppliers are very cooperative and help. And we need to really <coughs> start taking responsibility and working in a much more transparent way with our suppliers. That has to be the future. Um, I also believe that new businesses coming into the market need to adopt the 17 sustainable development goals. It's the only way businesses can really, really respond in the future to make our industry much safer and cleaner. Does that help? Yes. <laughs> yes, no, Sally, it was so well said. And, and you know, it is the actions that people are taking now that will determine the future and they can't be just looking at short term. So I don't know, Laura, if you want to add any of your comments to this Yeah, question. I mean, obviously Sally covered, covered it pretty well there, but we're seeing loads of reports coming out of um, clothing that's already been produced and has already been shipped and it's lying, for example, in customs in the UK and retailers are refusing to pay for it or they're asking for massive discounts. The same with products that are already in the production line or factories that have brought in raw materials and already paid for them and the brands are asking for discounts or indeed not willing to pay. And now is not the time for such a rash reaction, I don't think. Like brands and retailers have been spending years and years and years now convincing the suppliers that they're not just suppliers, but they're partners in this. So for them to just drop everything is not really a partnership way of working. And I think the brands and retailers really need to look closely at their behavior and look at whether they really consider these suppliers to be their partners and treat them with a little bit more respect, quite frankly, and have a little bit of empathy because they're all in countries such as Bangladesh and Pakistan. They don't have the government support like we do in the Western world. So for them, it, it can mean their workers can eat a day or they can't eat a day. So yeah, going forwards, I think the brands need to have a lot more empathy with their partners in these countries and really think about what they're doing right now and how they can improve their social responsibility. For sure, the empathy is so important. And, and maybe Harmony, do you want to weigh in on this a little bit too? Yes, so, oh, well, obviously Sally and Laura already said a lot. Uh, the only thing I, I would like to add is um, definitely some sort of loyalty that should definitely be there from the retailers to their suppliers and factories because they can't forget that the customer I think he's loyal to a brand and that should reflect in the same way the retailer should show loyalty to the retailers, uh, to, the, to the factories. I think they shouldn't forget their values, the values they show their customers so then the customer can return and continue to buy of them. So that would be another point that I wanted to, to add to just what we said, like show loyalty and support and then you'll have it in return from your customer. Customer is watching. We're definitely like more and more transparent transparent thanks to social media and this should definitely be taken in in consideration by retailers yes no, for sure it's not only how retailers and brands are treating the factories but i also see it's how retailers and brands are treating their own employees and one thing that is really surprising is that many of the brands have furloughed their own sustainability staff and, you know, during this time, we're getting a lot of questions, what will the future be? And, you know, will this increase the initiatives of the dentist supply chain and brands to incorporate low impact uh, practices? So Janelle, <laughs> how do you feel about this, where the brands and how they're treating their own staff and sustainability for the future? Uh, I mean, yeah, it definitely feels like, um, not the right time to be laying off sustainability staff, that's for sure. Um, it just kind of shows that how the brands are acting in their own interests. And that's, I mean, that's pretty hard behavior to kick. So the program to grow um, and not necessarily to care. And that's kind of a, a fundamental behavior habit that we've got to change if we want to truly um, have sustainable businesses in the future. Um, I mean, in terms of, initiatives in Denham. Um, 
I personally, I was really hoping that this time where we couldn't see any product, we couldn't put our hands on any product and we're not necessarily sell, selling stuff in the, um, in the shops would help us to get our house in order. And I would, was hoping to see um, more of a push and a focus on collection of data and transparency of data, which I think has been a bit of a missing piece of the jigsaw. Like we've constantly got new initiatives, we've constantly um, got new um, new products, the most sustainable this and the most sustainable that. But um, what I'm finding it really hard to build a picture of as a designer and as someone who recommends um, fabrics and uh, suppliers is where we're actually at so um where are we going at it's very rare that you see an actual carbon reduction strategy from from a mill um, and i'd really like to see more focus on that and see how all of these things are adding up to actually help us to achieve um the end goal which is essentially to um, mitigate climate damage um, so I'd love to see more focus on um, carbon reduction strategies on something like science-based targets where, they're, where that's actually verified um, and um, monitored, yeah, and more accountability. For sure, yeah, science-based targets I think are incredible and it takes us out of the whole greenwashing with yeah. how that program yeah. is set up, for sure. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a lot of kinds of, um, it's all very well presenting, saying you've you've developed the most sustainable denim in the world, but if you haven't published a sustainability report for four years, um, then something just doesn't add up there. And it, it may very well be that the house is in order, but it's really hard to make decisions when you don't have that information in front of you. Um, so yeah, I really think we need to up our game on that at the moment. And it needs to be verified data, not just made up figures, because you see a lot of that as right. well. I've seen it <laughs> recently. I mean, you pull your hair out looking at these sustainability reports. Some of them are brilliant, um, and that, that's great, but they're, they're still definitely in the minority. But, you know, you see things like 0% water and 90% chemical reductions, top energy savings. <laughs> like, what? we yeah. need to do better on that. We definitely do. Yeah. And Madeline, I don't know, would you like to weigh in on this and sustainability for the future? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with... What, um, uh, Janelle's saying, but I think also, um, as we heard from the panel, sustainability is so much bigger than just the product side because it's for the mm. moment, I think what I hear is worrying because all the different examples of um, we're seeing currently that compromising social sustainability. So I think when everyone is back, sustainability teams world over globally will have to look at the social side, not only product. Because I think um, technically, product-wise, I think the denim industry um, is on a path for using more low practices, low impact, uh, more sustainable uh, chemicals, and also to your uh, point, Janelle, with the data, we need to, we need to all use the systems that are going to be in place, and hopefully, I think uh, governments will have to legislate this. And I think this is coming very soon, especially in Europe. It's just um, to have this become a more global, um, like through global legislation, which I think is the way forward. And I think for us as uh, more creatives, uh, I think the main sustainable choice for me, uh, and I think for us as a group, uh, is to make the choice to be more creative and also think about using up existing stock, whether it's fabric, that's already existing garments that have been made there's already somewhere like you were saying like it's already been shipped or maybe it's at a suppliers before we start thinking up new ideas and producing new or ordering new fabrics and we are all creatives in this industry especially in denim where you can actually customize you can dye things you can rewash uh, you, you can do so much i mean in the past i've been sat cutting off denim you know jeans into shorts and reselling them for brands i've worked for and obviously try to recycle the rest of the leg but you know at least you're using what's already what, what's already been produced instead of now producing more or going back to where we were and us together we need to act now and make these choices um i mean you can feel like you're on a micro level but i think that's the only way that you can be able to impact the bigger picture and make changes on a macro level 
even if you you know we come together this we haven't done this before and this yeah. is how you you get your thoughts out there and yeah. i think for the moment we just all need to get together and be creative and be positive about the future sorry that was a bit long yeah. <laughs> no no it's so true i mean now is the time that we need to all work together and i think this is where we do have a chance to rebuild the industry that we really want to see uh, one thing that you mentioned is about more of the government involvement and and i think for me it's been very strange to be told by, by the government what i can do and what i can't do lockdowns um but you know will this government involvement continue and how can we make that be a good thing and how can we bring that into the denim industry to be more responsible in ways to reduce reduce the environmental impact? So, um, Harmony, I don't know if you have any further comments on this about the government involvement and where you see that in the denim industry. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, as it was mentioned uh, in, in the question, I think we've seen just now that never seen before decision has been made very quickly um, to, to save lives. And it's, it's nearly as if we need to address the same alarm bell for our industry, because if we all work together, it shows that we can get some results. And the, the end result we all want is to save lives within our country, but also the country of production. And it feels very often these two are, these two are, are splitted because we're not under the same government, but it shouldn't be really it should be like a team effort that we work together. So I think government should be involved in three key points. Um, so they should definitely impose transparency uh, to the retailers. Um, so that is something that should be done uh, very, very quickly. Um, second point will be to educate. I think it's the duty from a government to educate its population. So where is the garment coming from? How is it made? This is all needs to be shared and known because I don't think people at the moment necessarily want a sustainable garment, not everyone, because they don't have the information. So once everyone is educated, look, I believe definitely in the younger generation, but we all, all should get education all the time, every day, more and more. And this, after that, they can make the right decision. And uh, the third point for me will be definitely government to invest into a recycling machine, textile recycling machine, so it could be more accessible. So once the people mm -hmm. have the information, transparency the education through the process and then they, they can also have like access to this machine they can make the right decision so do i want to keep do i want to repair do i want to recycle but these all three parts are really key and they should be they should be definitely uh, made by the government at the top of the pyramid and then um, it's just a duty for a country Yes, yes. No, I agree, especially on the recycling, that if we had more government regulation, it would happen much faster and we could really impact to make the change. Um, Janelle, what are your thoughts around this? I mean, I absolutely I totally agree with that. These are the areas um, where we need government intervention. Yeah. <laughs> intervention. Um, I have to say, I don't have much confidence in my government at the moment um, to lead on this. We had a really big um, uh, environmental audit committee investigation into the fashion industry last year, and lots of great evidence was submitted in these areas. Um, but every single recommendation of that committee was rejected by the government and nothing was taken forward into legislation. Now the argument is that there are other more central um, cross-sector policies which may cover some of those things like recycling but it just seems so slow um, and um, I'm fearful that if we wait for government in intervention on things that action will not happen fast enough as fast as we need it. Um, in order to mitigate real climate damage. So I do think that while we're pushing, I think we need to politicize more um, as, um, as designers, as individuals, but also um, kind of corporately um, and write to MPs and get involved in, in government um, committees and evidence submission and stuff. But um, 
I also think at the same time we need to take more responsibility and that there's a lot of pressure on um, our industry bodies like the British Fashion Council or the, the American Fashion Council or the Global Fashion Councils that um, all of the trade shows um, to take a little bit of responsibility for setting standards and I know I think King things are really leading on that. Um, but yeah, uh, yes, I, I want and think we need government intervention to have a level playing field because as long as we don't have that, as long as people will make up their own rules and we'll always be trying to undercut each other. Um, but yeah, I think we need to do some stuff in the meantime as well. Yes, yes. And so just as much as the government has imposed the lockdowns, now it's interesting to see what the government's suggestions are on removing some of that and the relaxing of lockdowns. And, you know, the impact of that then for fashion, I'm here in New York and we're shut down until May 15th. I think it will take quite a bit of time until retail stores really come back. Um, but Sue, can you explain some of your thoughts on how you feel about the, the lockdown that's being relaxed now and, and the impact on retail stores? Uh, personally, the, the idea of relax, relaxing the lockdown is just terrifying. Uh, I think we've all, we've been sharing on uh, WhatsApp some photographs of Primark and CK Maxx um, and how, you know, people are going there with like great big trolleys piled up with incredible amount of objects that I'm sure they really don't need but uh, and so that sense of uh, you know everyone will rush back in the, the peaks are going to keep going up and down I, I find it really terrifying that uh, that we cannot as a community as citizens of the you know the world that you know we there's there's a new normal that is available to step into and um, and to create a new sort of code of conduct, and I um, I find it quite surprising that people aren't wanting to sort of to bring that towards themselves a little bit more. I have to admit, I was talking to somebody in France. Uh, their brand, the stores were opening, and they were saying that you know, for example, they would usually have four four staff members in this in this small shop. Um, and because of the, the pandemic, they can now have two members of staff in the shop and they can only allow two members of the public into the store. So they've got two people working in the store and at any time they can have four people because it's quite small. So anybody else who might be queuing up the street, the boredom factor of standing when you, you know, the olden days where you rush out at, at lunchtime because you needed to grab something or you wanted to get that, you know, instant gratification. The boredom of standing in a queue outside on the street it surely got to wear off um, so yeah. quickly. Um, so the whole shopping experience, the whole engagement of that, it, it, I mean, to me, it sounds absolutely numbing, not, not least the fact that you will be conscious of the fear factor that, that is running through your, your hormones will be running the fear. So there's so much possibility to create something way 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 better than we that we've ever experienced um, and i i'm much more excited about what we can create that's new and that will be a breath of fresh air um, than than actually just sort of like rushing back into what what actually wasn't you know our ideal normal anyway right no for sure it wasn't working before but what does it look like afterwards um, Claire, what are your thoughts around reducing the lockdown and what it means for retail? Um, I mean, I completely agree with everything that Sue's mentioned. I, you know, we need to protect our NHS and we also still need to protect all the people who are at risk. Um, but on the other hand, as well, we do need to consider and protect people's jobs. Uh, we know that retail and hospitality has been hit very hard. There's job losses that could become permanent unless um, the, the lockdown works and our economy gets on back, back on track. Um, what to consider when retail opens? I think there's um, obviously we've seen huge spending when retail's open, such as Hermes. I think they recorded. 2.7 million in sales on their um, first day of reopening. <laughs> Alternatively, I guess this does show a little bit of consumer confidence in spending. Um, online's been amazing, even for brands like Reese who have been selling out of denim. 
Um, and also, I mean, talking about confidence in people spending money, Outland's ongoing crowdfunding has been so far successful, even in these economic times. Uh, you know, it's, it might give you some insight into consumer confidence in sustainable fashion brands. Um, as one of the amazing things is that 73% of our investors so far are women which is normally the opposite way around this. And I personally find this really exciting. Um, specifically for Outland as well, I guess the flow of our retail is still really unknown, um, but we're trying to pivot our business and kind of change to, um, rather having, than having two big collections, having six collections um, a year to kind of, have a better manufacturing schedule, uh, be more nimble, uh, be able to react and hopefully um, create less waste as Janelle mentioned. Yeah, no, that's great to hear about some of the changes that Outland is making and that you were able to pivot so quickly. I think, you know, also what Stu mentioned around people, you know, buying so much, a lot of questions remain then around fast fashion and will this crisis be kind of the end of fast fashion and this you know constant need to consume um sally can you talk a little bit about that yeah i am um, unfortunately i don't think it's the end of fast fashion at the moment but it is an opportunity to change i think like harmony said i agree it's education we need to educate the customers we're also passionate about what we do in our industry but our customers and even my friends who know what i do don't really know how jeans are made um i don't know what they think they're made with i think they think we print them but i think until we can actually <laughs> share what we do with the customers um we have no chance to really like educate them to move forward and also being frankly honest a lot of buyers don't know what they're buying either so a lot of the buyers i've work with need educating and the teams and hopefully a lot of the companies I've worked with we've been doing that so we need to change the people to demand the change um, I think some credible brands who really have moved more sustainable and adopted you know sustainability within their fabrics and also new uh, better washing processes reducing the water switching to the new technology ozone laser etc I think um, they'll start to declare what they're doing a little bit more and communicate more with their customers I'm hoping some of the people I've talked to, we've been talking about QR codes in the labeling on the jeans so that people can scan this and have that transparency because we have to start being transparent with the customers. The customers that want to know the information, we need to put it on the product and that's gonna grow. I mean, look at the amount of veganism and you know the, the people who are really, really caring about the planet, the carbon footprint, and we need to be giving product information on clothing now as well. And it should become standard. This is where Janelle's right. The government need to be supporting us and kicking in. So I think the retailers are going to change after this. The fast fashion people are going to change. There's going to be so much pressure on them now because of this situation to look at their stocks, what they're left with, and to change their supply chain and manage better practices and manage their stocks. So I'm hoping there'll be a shift away from the way they currently work, they'll review their suppliers, they'll look how they're making goods, maybe they'll start bringing some things more local to give them more flexibility with their products. But I think it's starting to change, I think it started already and people are starting to care, but hopefully this will accelerate it a bit more because we have to reduce the waste. For sure, for sure, no definitely. So I, Laura, can you weigh in on fast fashion? Yeah, I mean, I think as much as all of us here today would love to be able to say that this could be the end of fast fashion, I think realistically, I don't think it can happen right now. Fast fashion has really kind of democratized fashion for everybody, allowing everybody to have a taste of it. And right now with the economic crisis that's going to happen after COVID, I just think so many people are not going to be able to think so hard maybe where they spend their money or they're not going to want to think so hard about where they spend their money so fast fashion is still going to be the main player i think i mean yeah our shops here opened in belgium yesterday and indeed in our group i was sending pictures to everyone of the photos of primark cna there were queues all the way down the street the police had to get involved because the queues were so long and yeah day one of the shops opening and the belgian retail organization announced last night that among the fashion retailers even though they were only allowed one person per 10 square meters in the shop, they averaged 50% of their daily turnover yesterday. 
So still, that's a lot yeah. of people going out shopping considering the current situation. And yeah, even the last few weeks before this, Belgium is not a big online shopping culture. That culture doesn't really exist here. We don't have Amazon here, for example. So people generally don't order very much online. But walking around my neighborhood on thin night, there's Zalando boxes everywhere, Zara boxes. So people's mindset to shop online has also changed a lot in the past couple of months here. And people are still consuming fast fashion online. So yeah, right now I don't really think it's something that's gonna change very quickly. And as Sally said, I think we're, we've been stuck in this kind of catch 22 for the last few years with retailers producing a lot of product because they're saying that customer, dem customer demand is there, but customers are demanding that product because they're very used to be able to spend a couple of euros to buy a t-shirt or whatever. So it's a vicious circle that's been going round and round and round for years now with everybody blaming the other side. And at some point that system needs to change. And I think when everyone's back up and running again, the brands and the retailers, they really need to look carefully at their inventory management. They need to start to look about how much production they're placing without having sold it in advance and really think the whole process. I mean, it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning about not just the social and the economic sustainability and the general sustainability questions. They really need to think about the ways of working completely and how the whole process of fast fashion is happening because the customer's mind is not going to change if the retailer's mind doesn't change. So somehow the two of them need to work together and we need to get out of this vicious cycle that we've been seeing now for years. I don't think it's gonna happen quickly, but like Sally said, hopefully with more of us talking about things like this, the general consumers will start to question a little bit more things and not just accept that product is there for the buying. So hopefully collaboratively we can go forwards and slowly but surely change the situation. Yes, and have the chance to sort of reset the consumption levels for sure. Yeah. And Kelly, we haven't really heard from you. Okay. What's your take on this? There you are. Yay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, what was just said, I totally agree with. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's the end of fast fashion, but I also see that the, the loss of income um, during this whole crisis we'll see people spending more on fast fashion, unfortunately, like we've seen all you know, those pictures in the news. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I do think that it is here to stay. <laughs> um, I know myself, I have ha had a kind of chance to maybe rethink my um, spending habits whilst I've been off um and maybe rethink about um more important things like real life kind of like spending time with my family and and wanting to do all of those things rather than spending my money on something that perhaps I don't need so yeah yeah <laughs> for sure it's been more time with family and friends or yeah. connecting in other yeah. ways yeah and, and as I kind of mentioned, you know, will, will this sort of change, you know, the consumer's buying habits, the consumption, the styles? Leanne, what do you think about that? Where, where do we see that? Where do you see that going? Um, I also voice, uh, continue what Sue mentioned before about there's a new way, possibly. I think it's a great opportunity for change and reflection during this lockdown time. Um, we're spending more time and appreciating nature with our daily exercises that we're allowed on our doorstep due to lockdown and I think we're all seeing the impact that already like the reducing in air traffic is having I seem to think the air is cleaner I don't know whether it actually is but it seems cleaner to me and how much more I'm hearing the wildlife around me for the first time because there's not so much traffic on the roads um, and I think maybe people share the same appreciation that I'm having with nature and connecting to it with a bit more, to so much so that they might want to have a bit more of awareness and want to help protect it for the first time too. So maybe they will consider to shop less. And when they do shop, buy things that are made to last and not just fast fashion and be a bit more conscious overall. I mean, and as we've said before, like financially speaking, we are set to unfortunately head into the worst financial crisis of our time and potentially to the end of our time. So this will reflect people spending less because they have less expendable income. Um, 
and I really do hope they decide to invest in product that lasts and not fast fashion. Um, Style-wise, if we take a moment to consider what we're all wearing right now and how we've changed what we're wearing, like Kelly said, like I've really taken time to really appreciate my wardrobe and what I have and also my spending habits. I don't I rotate like within a few outfits. I don't use, I don't need as much as I think we've all been told that we need. We've all been in a bubble set by this industry that we need to, we have so many seasons set out by luxury brands that we all feel the need to keep up and to continue with that pace. Um, Saint Laurent just declared a short while ago that they're not going to take part in any fashion shows for the rest of this year with a view to consider reducing how many seasons we have, which I think would be incredible because really, you know, if luxury changes that calendar and we all start reducing the seasonality that we have within a year, consumers will feel less pressure, as will the rest of us, to feel the need to continually buy. And that will help, I think, filter down the chain if we can, then the retail would have to respond to that too. And we're already seeing people saying that it's been overdue to reset because we're still selling outerwear when it's still summer and no one's changed the calendar. So I think it could be a really good time to reset how we all think and how we all buy. Um, and in terms of trend, I don't think we're all going to give up comfort very soon because we've all embraced it so well at the moment. I'm not going to give up my comfort. So I think in denim terms, um, we might be looking into looser fits continuing and softer hand feel fabrics, um, maybe with like some stretch properties, but also with this newfound eco awareness, perhaps within more nature and natural fiber contents like hemp or cotton and people being a bit more considerate to the content of the items they're buying and for it, for it to be like a 360 eco awareness that would be my dream right. no that's yeah. would be a kind of reality <laughs> but um, right. it would be right. nice if people had that kind of awareness or thought path yeah and, and kelly what do you see might change in styles will comfort be here to stay uh, kelly? yeah definitely <laughs> i mean <laughs> I have kind of um, embraced this time to kind of um, really, yeah, as you just said, like go out on nature walks and really appreciate this. I really have appreciated this extra time. So I have literally lived in the most comfortable clothes <laughs> ever. Um, and so, yeah, I really see um, cozy fits and a feeling of being like safe, um, comfortable styles and even kind of like nostalgic um kind of feeling as well that it brings you because um we want to think about um the times that we could do different things before um this pandemic so i i know you also feel that um there is such a big emphasis on um crafting and um vintage right now so everyone is swapping people's wardrobes at the moment so they're online and they are doing their clothing sales and um so second hand and um but this is su such a big thing i mean it always has been but i i feel that even more so for the general public now um yeah it's it's been huge online especially on instagram where people have been um upcycling things um embroidering things tie-dyeing it's kind of a new we've kind of refreshed our wardrobes without even knowing it kind of by doing this right. creative work yes yes i agree with you on the nostalgia and i'm wearing my jacket today is one that Mosin had designed it designed and Saudia did the uh the trims for from our last collection so i, mm -hmm. I agree with you the nostalgia when i look in my wardrobe of of the past so, Sadia, um, we haven't had a chance to chat with you. Uh, without having any trade shows, no travel, how are you adapting to the design process for inspiration? Um, hi, everyone. Um, I've essentially, you know, a lot of my job is um, storytelling and creating company profiles, um, storytelling on um, a new product that's come out, you know, every season. Um, whether if it's in a photo shoot or just an online campaign or an advert. So Kingpins 24 was really interesting for me because I actually got a chance to get an overview 
of um, everyone's presentations, and it was more of a case of actually seeing what's working and what was what isn't working. And I think uh, it was Janelle, wasn't it? You set up um, our little London group that day um, at the beginning of you know that morning in a group. And it was really great because um, I was getting live feedback on you know what people were thinking and they really enjoyed about it and, they did it. and so um, it was a really clear indicator to me about um, where I need to go in terms of storytelling um, when we come out of this. Um, and then I think you know in terms of adapting the work that I do. Um, Moving on to the headspace videos, Trisha, because it was you and I and we sat down and we were, you know, I think we were all in that early, those early days feeling quite numb with everything going on. And I just felt this really strong need mm. to document how everyone was feeling because I was seeing it online. I could see my friends posting um, how they're feeling and what they're doing and things all of a sudden got very personal and a bit slower and a bit um a lot of anxiety in the air as well um around that time so i just thought that it was really great to document that process and so we reached out to a few people and the idea of it um of creating those short videos that have they've come out now um they're on the blue lens youtube channel um if you haven't seen them. um the purpose for those were to you know, to look back on that on this time and just see what we, you know, the good things that we can carry forward with us that we've learned in this time. Um, so adapting to new ways of creativity, new ways of working, and I've actually been really busy. Um, I haven't really stopped. Um, yeah. Working, so I'm really jealous of people having a nice yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. So yeah. Yeah, and Leanne, what, how has it been for you without having trade shows for inspiration? Do you know what? I don't really um, have too much negative things to say about it other than um, it's been a bit of an eye-opener as a designer. Um, technology is fantastic and I feel more connected than ever. I mean, I wouldn't be having this chat with you guys and this main, amazing panel right now if it hadn't been for lockdown um, and COVID. You know, it's all brought us all together and it's been an amazing time to reset and talk and think about how we're doing things and potentially how many trade shows we're going to that are so unnecessary. I mean, you get a little bit of anxiety as a designer because there's so many trend shows that we should be going to. You know, there's normal PV, there's denim PV, there's kingpings, and we all go to all of them thinking we might see something different. But actually, in reality, we probably only need to go to one. And with Kingpin's going online and doing Kingpin 24, it was amazing. I felt like I had a magic stopwatch. I could watch every single film. Um, and if I missed an interview, I could go back over two weeks and take my time to really digest it. If I missed an email, I could just quickly go back and I've pestered so many of the people that actually spoke because I want to learn more during lockdown. So it's given me a great opportunity to do that. Um, and just, yeah, I could really reduce my carbon footprint as a result. Uh, which I think is quite an interesting reflection for me. I mean, the only thing, of course, is we don't get to fill the fabric, which is huge of the skin denim. You know, we don't get to fill the newness or see the newness like, in our hands, which is really important. But other than that, you know, how are we going to overcome it? Because this is going to be quite difficult, even if lockdown is a little bit easier in the coming months or later in the year. A mill is going to have to change the way they work. Are they going to have to think about putting local offices near key customers uh, rather than maybe, I don't know, attend all the trade shows themselves or <coughs> reach out to those that can't? Um, I think if we try and adopt some of the new ways of working, like a Kingpin's continue to post content, post shows, I think that could be an incredible opportunity and a new learning for all of us that we never had the opportunity to do before. I mean, everything else in terms of looking at what other brands are doing is still possible. We see everything online. Instagram is on fire at the moment. I'm following more people than ever. I'm finding more interesting people to follow. And like Kelly said before, all the make, do and mend that's happening at the moment is really fun. And seeing what people come up with is really exciting. So, yeah, yeah. I'm not that bad 
I'm not that affected, if I'm honest. Just right. the feeling of the fabric. Yeah. Yeah, so there was a huge savings in the carbon footprint from people not going to Kingpins in Amsterdam. And Malin, what's your thoughts about without having the trade shows uh, and how you're being inspired? Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is that um, everything is sort of, I've sort of slowed down, uh, taking a course from everything. And it's really quite nice to have that sort of feeling of a time when I can reset. But part of it is also actually about speeding up. It's the total opposite. And by speed, I mean like joining these sort of initiatives, uh, which I rarely have time to do. And I don't, we don't really have this sort of outreach in the community, in the denim community always, because it's so fast. Um, you know, I'm attending online workshops and other live webinars. Um, and also with Kingpins 24, it was, I mean, it, I thought it was really great and it brought us all in a way closer, even if we're further away from each other because we're not there. But I um, agree because the whole thing about feeling the fabric, I really missed that and I didn't have the connection as much with that. But um, so that was disappointing. And I think that's really difficult to convey online or through any sort of online media. Um, but that's something we can also, you know, you follow up with, you get leads and you meet new people online. So I thought it was really good, but I, I actually look forward to going Kingpins. And I um, also take the train over, so um, the carbon footprint is slightly less anyway. But I miss the social right. side and the fabric side, of course. And that's the way, that's why I feel actually, for me, that's sort of sped up in a way. And that's that part of it, because I don't really do a lot of online. Um, the slow and the pause for me, uh, it sort of made me sort of reset. And I'm using this time to, I go through, I'm in my studio for the moment. I'm going through my vintage archive um, and I'm using my own library at home for research. And I normally go, I go to libraries normally, but I now I have to use my own library. And I actually got a really big denim research library, which is great. Lots of reference books. Uh, and I don't always now turn to online resources as much as I normally do for research because I got the time to look at the books. Uh, and also I've had time to go through my, my archive uh, and work on some handmade pieces. I do a lot of mending, patchworking, and I'll, I'll have time to, to look at those pieces and hopefully set up my, my own sort of online stores to sell them some of my spe more special pieces as well. And I don't normally have time to do that. So it's, it's a bit of both, it's speed. Yeah. But that's, that's the online thing for me. And the slow is getting closer to what I actually do and uh, just feeling a bit more almost forced to, to actually just be closer to, to what I actually do and what I love to do. Right, yeah, it does give you time to do other things. So we have one more question and then I wanna be able to jump into all the great questions that we see coming through. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, Sue, what have you been doing for your own creative development uh, during this time? Well, it's, it's interesting, just with Marlin, I was thinking everyone's been sort of like, you know, the enforced pause has actually, given people a lot more chance to not have to respond so much to what's going on in their busyness and all the stuff's going on. So actually being able to look at the midterm or the long-term perspectives of or what's actually doing them, it, it just sounds like it's a much better setting because it does give you a, a much better perspective. Um, but in terms of my creativity, I have to make uh, most of my work just sort of fell as with with a lot of people a lot of uh, freelancers it was all gone uh, and i just thought okay so if i'm not going to give the money what would i have to be doing so the, the humanity aspect that for me was really really key um at kingpins 24 uh were just the loveliest thing it was the slowness it was the realness um and for me that was the thing that was the most resonant um, and, and that's the thing that for me has, has kick-started some projects that I'm doing, which are, you know, there's, there's no money involved, it's just passion projects that I want to be involved in, that really talk about, you know, the humanity in our industry and the people and, and the stuff that we fell in love with. 
um, in terms of products and the narratives behind the products. And there's some, there's some uh, it's quite, I get quite tearful when I'm reading the comments that people are sending in to me because in some cases it's like, you know, people are saying that over the last 15 years there's been such a dramatic change in the speed in the way that people develop. And that, you know, years ago it would be the designers would sit around the table and you'd be talking about the beauty of the product and you'd have a nice dinner and everyone would come with like a playlist and they'd be talking about their family. And it was, you know, the Denim family. That's what we, that's what we were thinking when we started in the industry. And, um, and one, there was, a, there was a really resonant thing that came through in one of the messages today that was like, not just has fast fashion changed denim, but it's also changed the behavior of the people in the denim industry and actually that's that's really that was really profound for me because it does when we're too busy our behavior changes and for me that's the beauty of what we're experiencing today is that we can slow it down and we can remember to um, and and I think that's such a good thing. So and and yeah, I'm just you know, one of the other things that I'm doing, which I don't know if you call it creativity, but creativity for my soul is I trained as a life coach a few years ago, and I I feel really uh, like really moved to 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 offer that. So I'm offering free life coaching at the moment Fridays. Um, which again is it's it's a way that you can support your community. You know, I haven't got time to make uh, scrub with an eight-year-old to homeschool, but I can, I can, you know, support the community. So it's when you don't have to just do things on the immediate deadlines, I just think the freedom can give you so much that feeds you in such a different way. Yes, no, that's true. That's great that you're doing the life coaching on Fridays. Yeah. And Sadia, I know you've been spending some time in the garden. Um, how has your creativity been during this period? Um, it's, I mean, I've been... As I mentioned, I've been really busy, so I haven't had as much time to take a pause um, as much as I'd like. But we decided to let the garden just kind of grow out um, while everyone else is on a pause. I just wanted to give the garden a pause as well and just let everything grow through and let the um, n let nature do its thing. And so we've had really beautiful um, tulips coming through and like with really high grasses. And so I've been doing a bit of photography. Um, it's been really lovely. Um, and I've been painting, a um, bit of drawing, a bit of, you know, um, all of that. So, so that's kind of really been helping with the overwhelm that um, I think initially a lot of us were not in the beginning. Um, so that's been nice. <laughs> yes, it's good to have that time. And, and Claire, for you, um, what other creative outlets have you been inspired by lately? I mean, I've been doing some art too, actually, but with weather like this, how can you not? <laughs> um, I know, I, you've been very fortunate in the UK. We haven't been in the US. So. <laughs> I think we've been so lucky. Like, last weekend was amazing. Um, but, yeah, like all of the women here, I mean, I'm normally super busy myself all the time. So I found this time amazing just to slow down and focus um even within my work as well and designing for outland denim we've been able to kind of be more creative and um like sue said as well you know kind of take a back seat and then start to review all of your products again and say do we really need this in the range is it you know does it have a great end use is it going to be in your wardrobe for years um and so we've kind of really been creative in reassessing, redeveloping. I've been really kind of like creatively influenced by the women at Outlands. I'm on the phone to the pattern cutter every day on with the wash guy and that's been amazing for me as well to kind of have that chance to do that with them. Um, and to be honest, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to it, it's, it's not only about designing and making clothes sustainable, but it's something that we want to design going forward that is um, going to be in your wardrobe for years. And I really think that adds value to the garments that you're designing. And, and that's kind of, you know, the ethics of what both Outlands and myself represent. That's great. Yes, that's so true. So let's dive into some of the questions that we have here. Um, starting off with the question that we actually received on email in advance, 
Uh, what suggestions do you have to help make the general public care more about the planet and put their money where their mouth is? I mean, we touched on this a little bit in the discussions um, about sustainability and what it means, but how do we really get uh, people to, to, to vote with their dollars? Uh, any comments on that? Who would like to step in? I mean, I've got um, a more comment. Um, I guess working with Outlands is you can kind of see the transparency of the company. And like I mentioned in the crowdfunding, people are putting their money when they know about the company. So I think it's educating and being transparent, being sustainable, um, like we've said, not environmentally, but economically and socially. So, you know, fashion is about humans as well. It's not, you know, as well as the earth, it, it's about to do with all of us. Yes, no, that's true. Yeah. So I have another, is there someone else who would like to answer that? Yeah, I just, just if it's, I just think that um, it's something that we, we all naturally, as consumers, we trust that the company that we're buying from is doing the right thing, that they're creating the right products and that they're, they're using the right chemicals. And I think if you were to, you know, we, like I, I have no idea about toothpaste, for example, but I would be absolutely horrified to find out that they might be putting something in toothpaste that would have some minor, you know, trace that would be bad for our bodies. And I think that blindly as consumers, we do, we do tend to buy things. But being able to educate, I mean, Instagram is so fantastic at in encouraging people to buy at the moment. It's not just your friends you look at, it's all the brands that subliminally make you feel like, oh my God, I need another full dress. Wow, I didn't even know I needed that. Um, but if, if actually there was more information that was coming through, uh, and there are some so many dynamic um, women to watch and men to watch out there, but to be able to pass those messages through to consumers where it's like, do you know what green is made from in your clothes or do you know what this is made from and i think it's that that it would be lovely to see that start to come through education at a really bite-sized amount because it's pretty it's pretty hard to get your head around if we were able to break it down and make it more bite-sized and make it quicker to understand people would start to demand more i think is it i i read something the other day that was later looking at his his collection of pottery and it was saying you know, his favorite things were the wonky ones not the ones that were perfect but the wonky bits and as a consumer we don't generally go for the wonky ones we like the ones that are perfect but in denim we understand that wonky is great we like wonky yeah. but it's it's yeah. it's creating that mind shift and you know organic vegetables when you buy stuff that's that's a bit more unusual we now understand that it's okay but 15 years ago, no, 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 it has to be a perfect carrot. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's just being able to put that into consumers' mindsets. You know, wonky is fine. <laughs> and less wonky. Yeah. Less Tell the wonky story. I like that, Sue. Uh, one of our other questions here that I think is quite intriguing um, that was submitted on our question uh, chat here is how many of you feel it's a boys club in denim and that only certain mills, designers, and brands are promoted as sponsored content in magazines? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Would you like me? <laughs> I think we've all got something to say about that. <laughs> but, yeah. hey, Janelle, do you want to kick it off? Um, I mean, yeah, I think we have, we've, we've discussed this. Our group is not an um, a exclusive women in denim group or WhatsApp group, but we are a strong majority. Um, we've had some chats about it. And I think we've, we've all definitely felt that at some stage. Um, I mean, I've, I've noticed at times um, in denim publications that you can flick through it and find maybe three women. Um, featured in it and then when you go to a trade show you see that we're more or less 50 50 represented and so you can you have to question like what's going on here why why is this happening um, and on that level it's been quite a recent awakening for me but I have definitely always um, I've felt challenged in many of my jobs as well where um, often you find that towards um, as you go up in the company that there are more and more men and less less women and um, when you you know you're faced with designer views where you're presenting to a group of men and receiving comments about how women want their bodies to look and um, I've always 
find that side of things quite challenging as well. Um, but I do think that, I mean, thank you um, for hosting um, an all women's panel. Um, and I, I do think that we're noticing it more and that's the first step, I think, really to improving it. Yes, exactly, to empower our position. Yeah. Um, uh, Sally, did you have something to add to that? Your, your flash yeah. on the screen. Yeah. I was going to say I've obviously travelled a lot and I found the boys club more to be overseas so working in countries yeah. like flesh that's we've had to face that for a long long time as women and also stand up and make your voice heard and lead people as well and I hope we've really overcome I work with some great teams out there but I haven't particularly noticed it too bad at this side of the industry but definitely overseas it's um, not such a big thing in the uk i think the industry is much more balanced in uk because i've worked in uk retail and then i've worked in european brands in european brands it was def definitely a little bit more the boys club thing not yeah. not always but there were there are a lot more cases of it in the uk it's quite rare i think yeah no we've yeah. all had the, where's your boss when you go to the factories you know your boss <laughs> you? so it's actually me i'm a woman so get used yeah. to it but, you know i think hopefully over time you build relationships and it starts to change and i'm starting to see more women in leadership positions in the mills mm. and the overseas companies and the fact just as well which is really really important but i moment. wanted to take a couple more questions and there's one here that uh, i think is quite relevant and, and something that i'm always uh, promoting to and trying to raise awareness and that's around the un sustainable development goals so how many of you feel that 2030 is too late for the sustainable goals? Um, what money spent on trade shows should be put into sustainable technology and education? And um, like I have on here, the, the SDGs and what they represent. So would anybody like to comment on the SDGs and 2030 being too late? How can we implement this a little faster? I think it is quite late but at the same time it's quite an ambitious project for the world in general because it's not just specifically to our industry the sustainable Correct. goals are relevant to all industries and to individuals to corporations to everybody globally so yes it is a long time in the future 2030 but there's no reason why some of them can't be achieved quicker and if they are then that's amazing and yeah if things get achieved quicker then new goals can be set so yes i think it's a long way in the future but at the same time these things also have to be done in a proper way and the results need to be documented properly going back to the data question that janelle talked about earlier these things need to be quantified in the correct way that their goals have been achieved so to be able to do that we do need an element of time as well once they have been achieved for them to be properly properly documented in data to be supporting it so yes i think they're a long time in the future but at the same time it's a goal that everyone has to work towards if the goal gets reached quicker then that's amazing yeah i agree with you there are very ambitious goals i think in the denim industry we can definitely highlight several that that we can make an impact on yeah. um but without them i kind of felt like everyone was sort of floundering around so yeah. this at least gives us the focus of a framework so yeah. Um, I have another question here. What do you think about retailers and their role in this current scenario? They've asked factories since many years to invest in sustainability and social responsibility. But what are they doing now and not supporting poor people? And um, Sally, you, you didn't mention anything about your GoFundMe, but I thought this might be an opportunity for you to highlight one of what you've been working on there. Yeah, we just launched the GoFundMe for PDs who work at Debenhams to try and support our colleagues in Bangladesh. So we're trying to raise some money. Um, they really, really need the help. They haven't been paid their last month's wages. So it's really, really important we, that we, we care if the businesses aren't going to do anything. We're also trying to sort of put some pressure on Debenhams as well to look at themselves and look at the way they're working at the moment and what they're saying. You know, it's a very credible reputable British brand but to just lay off 69 people without the last month's salary and no hope of the future in this current situation is just devastating it really is um, the point about the fact is involving uh, investing in sustainability I'm as guilty as any from the last 10 years we've been pushing the factories to buy this equipment to invest heavily and it's become a fantastic competition between the factories almost as who has the latest technology 
who can, uh, you know, who's using the best chemicals, who's reducing their footprint the most. And we really do have to support it. But again, that comes back to education. I mean, I look and how many designers know the right enzyme to put in that machine? Who's using low temperature enzymes? Who's able to work with ozone and know the impact on the fabric? We as designers and uh, buyers as well, have to understand the technology properly to request the products to support the factories. If you don't know your cotton fibre, whether we want pencil or fibre, how are we going to build the fabric and then how are we going to dye the fabric to sustainably wash that fabric? So it needs to be easy wash to suit the equipment these companies that the uh, suppliers have invested in. It is education right the way through our chain because if we don't know our jobs well enough and we can't understand this technology to design into this technology, how do we expect the factories to use that technology properly and deliver on the investment? So there's a big chain here to be fulfilled, but I think um, we have to support them. They spent so much money and we have to make sure all our products are now engineered to suit that technology that we've asked for. Yes, no, that's true. And the education is key. Um, we're going to ask, this is our last question, and it's from Will, uh, and I, I've often thought this too, Will, so I'm glad you, you asked it. Are there any instances in recent memory, which might be similar to the situation we find ourselves in, that we can study and look to for guidance on how to proceed? Um, I mean, obviously, we've never lived through a pandemic before, uh, and in many cases in, the, in New York City, we, things get compared to our current situation to 9-11. Um, but does anyone have any thoughts on, on any other uh, comparisons to what we're going through now? I feel like it's totally unprecedented. And um, I think we're all in a bit of shock at the moment. And you can see that in governments as well as they kind of like rattle around trying to come up with plans and quickly trying one thing and then changing tack and trying something else. So I think it might be a little bit like that as well with our industry and I hope like some of the actions that we talked about earlier like people um, furloughing and getting rid of um, their sustainability and CSR teams and stuff to cut costs I hope things like that will be quickly addressed but um, yeah I do think uh, unfortunately there's there's no precedent for this yes you want to go yeah no it's three really uh, times that we've all never felt before and like everything that we've said through this, you know, how, how we can learn from it. And that's why it also helps that we all talk about it in order to cope and, and get through. So uh, we're going to be closing soon. It's a one final question and want to mention to everybody, um, follow us on Carved in Blue. We will be posting this, uh, this session on our Blue Lens, our video channel on YouTube. And next Tuesday, we're going to have another session because we had such overwhelming response uh, for panelists. So we will be having another session next week, mixing it up a little bit um, with some, some women from around the world and their thoughts on what's happening right now. But just in closing, I'd like to give everyone, uh, if you could say in one word, how you currently feel about the denim industry. And we'll start with Claire and go alphabetically. Claire? One word, denim industry today. Oh, it's, oh no, it's not one word. I'm like, human, it's human, and that's what we need to go ahead and approach is our responsibility to humans. For sure. Harmony? Uh, yes, I would say that the, the innovation is at its best, and we need to use this time to make it happen for everyone. Great. Janelle? Um, as I think there's really loads of things to be proud of um, but yeah I think we've still got a lot of work to do on um, yeah making sure that we're transparent about stuff. Great. Kelly? Uh, I would say uh, probably could do better with transparency. Sorry to be the one with the, <laughs> with the down. <laughs> yeah and Laura? <laughs> To quote our friends from Turkey, I would say evolving. Mm. Okay. Leanne? Um, I would have to say hopeful because we're all here talking about it right now and we all have this platform to share what we're feeling and also to name and shame and also bring stories to light like Sally's doing with her amazing projects. Like this is changing. We are all changing right now. 
Yeah. Melon? Uh, I would probably say uh, collective. That's really important for me, uh, not only in the denim industry, but something I always felt. And I think it's even now more than ever, it's more important that everyone comes together as a collective. Collective, yes. Sadia? Um, I would go with unbalanced. Um, I would, you know, there's so many amazing things um, in denim, but there's also so many things that I think need, that are clearly not working. So I think unbalanced is the right word for that. Great. Sally? Obviously educational. We're learning the mistakes that have been made and how to put them right. And we're learning new skills online and from the companies to make us do our job better. So educational is how I see this time. Great. And Sue, we'll end with you. I'm going with champion. <laughs> I just think there's something about really championing the people that are doing a great job. And uh, I don't think there's enough positive feedback in the world in general. Um, but championing the stuff that is great, but it, but as well as that, it's championing the stuff that has done been done so brilliantly in the past. And instead of constantly going forward, championing the stuff of old, all the greats that have already been created, and slow it down and focus on those. Um, so yeah, champion, because because we all is. <laughs> Great. And Sue, I love that we're going to end on that high note. We're going to champion and move forward together. And I, I thank all of you for your time today. It's been fun to do this. Um, it was a large group and I hope everyone felt they had a chance to, to voice their opinion. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll do another round of this with our friends here from UK and Belgium. Thank you so much for joining Trisha. us today. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.